It's been 102 years since the end of the First World War, marked every year on what most of us refer to as Remembrance Day. That is the 11th day of the 11th month at 11 o'clock. Or we could say that 102 years ago, on the 11th November at 11 o'clock 1918, for the soldiers, the fighting stopped. Supporting our allies, Britain joined the First World War on August 4th, 1914. Words like, it'll be over by Christmas, were heard throughout the country and many believed that this war would be short-lived. Little did they know that the war would go on to last four long, bloody years, resulting in the slaughter of millions of men on the battlefields throughout France, Belgium and many other countries. We can never begin to imagine the experiences that faced the brave men and women who contributed to the British war effort, both abroad and at home. Over the years, we've had the privilege to visit many of the sites of the First World War battlefields. Many of you listening today may have been part of that experience. In these unprecedented times, some of you may not have been able to have that experience this year. As part of a series of virtual assemblies commemorating Remembrance Day at Inverkeaton High School, this morning's assembly is going to take you on a short journey with some of the soldiers to the battlefields of France and Belgium during the war, through their thoughts and their experiences and their words, many of which were found from letters and diaries written in the trenches to interviews made after the war had ended. Today, we are going to take some of their words and give them a voice. Our pals battalion was formed as a result of an appeal from the Mayor of Sheffield, Lieutenant Colonel Branson. Colonel Hughes was our first commanding officer and by God, what a splendid lot of men he had to command. University students, doctors, dentists, opticians, solicitors, accountants, banks officials, schoolmasters, shop owners, post office staff, you name it. Professional men, not professional soldiers, but when they got to the trenches, they behaved like professional soldiers. For me, it was seeing a picture of Kitchener and his finger pointing at you. In any position that you took up, the finger was always pointing at you. I felt I just had to do my bit. It was a wonderful poster, really. It's not just a sudden decision that I made to join the army. If you looked in the newspapers, we saw that the Canadians were coming. The Australians were coming, the South Africans were coming. They were catching the first available boat to England to get there before the war was over. When you went to the pictures, you'd be shown crowds of young men around the recruitment office, or it might be a band playing Tipperary. The whole thing was exciting. I don't know whether patriotism entered into it or not. Possibly so. We were stirred by the atrocities, or the alleged atrocities, when the Germans invaded Belgium and France. The other great factor was that the women folk, 50% of the population, were very keen on the war. Before long, we were offering to do the jobs we men had done in civil life so that we could be released. Some of them would stop us in the street and say, well, why aren't you in khaki? But I felt we were not pressed. We made our own decisions. Well, a lot of people thought it would be over by Christmas. I was never one of those who thought that at the beginning. Well, I put it down about a year. I think most of us thought it would only last about a year. We thought it couldn't possibly go any longer than that. We had been brought up on the history of the Boer War and patriotism and heroics and everything, and we thought the war was going to be over before we could get there. However, in about half a minute all that had gone, I wondered what the devil I'd got into, because it was nothing but mud and filth and all the chaps who were already there, well... They looked like tramps, all plastered with filth and dirt and unshaven. After being in the trenches for a very short time, every individual became verminous, lice, body lice. Getting rid of them took part of our time, so usually when one got back behind the line, in a comparatively quiet space, one would take off one's shirt and crack the lice between our thumbnails. Lice were a curse. They were a real menace to us, although you had very few chances of getting a good sleep anyway. But lice, they were there to irritate you, drive you into sort of frenzy almost, and the rats were pests too. Seeing our rations and spreading disease, you couldn't avoid it. There was nowhere else to go.
During a gas attack, the men came tumbling from the front line. I've never seen men so terror-stricken. They were tearing at their throats and their eyes were glaring out. Blood was streaming from those who were wounded and they were tumbling over one another. Those who fell couldn't get up because of the panic of the men following them and eventually they were piled up two or three high in this trench. One chap had his hand blown off and his wrist was fumbling around, tearing at his throat. In fact, it was the most gruesome sight I'd seen in the war. For a full week, we were under incessant bombardment. Day and night, the shells came upon us. Our dugouts crumbled. They would fall on top of us and we'd have to dig ourselves and our comrades out. Sometimes we find them suffocated or smashed to a pulp. Soldiers in the bunker became hysterical. They wanted to run out. Even the rats became hysterical and came into our flimsy shelters to seek refuge from this terrific artillery fire. For seven days and seven nights, we had nothing to eat and nothing to drink, while shell after shell rushed upon us. After this, the British Army went over the top. The very moment we felt their artillery fire was directed against the reserve position, our machine gunners crawled out of their bunkers, red-eyed and dirty, covered in the blood of their fallen comrades, and opened up a terrific fire. Just before the attack, they gave us rum. I suppose that made it a little bit better. The fact that the others were there kept you going, but I had a terrible feeling. I shouted down the left and right of my sector five minutes ago, then four minutes, then three minutes, two minutes, half a minute, then 10 seconds. Get ready, over. When I went over, I didn't really think of anything. I just had to go, that was all. At the Somme, our battalion had 500 casualties, and I've lost most of my friends. But it was no use bothering. We knew they'd gone. It was mud, mud everywhere. Mud in the trenches, mud in front of the trenches, mud behind the trenches. Every shell hole was a sea of filthy, oozing mud. I suppose there's a limit to everything, but the mud of Passchendaele, to see men sinking into the slime, dying in the slime, I think it absolutely finished me off. I think I was going to get killed. Every time I went out to mend the wire, I think I was the biggest coward on God's earth. There are many days when I simply don't know what happened because I was so damn tired. The fatigue in that mud was something terrible. You reach the point where there's no beyond. You just couldn't go any further. I think I was broken in spirit and mind. One thing I shall never forget was my first experience of dead bodies. One day the weather was very hot and I was sent up to an observation post. I went with a marvellous officer who was later killed. We found we literally couldn't walk along the trenches without treading on dead bodies, German and British. 
The stench and the flies were simply appalling. That was one of the most miserable memories I have of the war. It was pathetic, really. Eventually, one just got over it and thought nothing of it. We couldn't help it. We were alive, and that's what mattered. And being alive, well, we jolly well had to get on with it. When the armistice was signed, it wasn't like London, where they all got drunk, of course. No, it wasn't like that. It was all very quiet. You were so dazed, you just didn't realise that you could stand up straight and not be shot. I wasn't at all a brave man. I wasn't one of those who volunteered to go over the top whenever there was a chance. It was an experience that you knew nothing about. You just jumped up onto the trench and hoped that you wouldn't meet a bullet. Actually, going over and seeing one man drop and another man drop and you wonder why you were still going. I always put it down to the prayers of my mother and father, but I didn't deserve to get through it at all. How did we get through? Partly the fear of fear, the fear of being found afraid. Another factor is the belief in human beings, your colleagues. Half of the men, I'm sure, had no idea what they were fighting for, but they went and gave their lives. The armistice came, the day we had dreamed of. The guns stopped, the fighting stopped. Four years of noise and bangs ended in silence. The killing stopped. We were stunned. I'd been out since 1914. I should have been happy. I was sad. I saw the slaughter, the hardships, the waste, and the friends I had lost. 